he is supposed to come after the elections. And so clearly, we want to be thankful to the court, the judge, and to say that we are most grateful for the ruling given to us today because we have achieved what we wanted to achieve. In terms of the legal arguments today, a chunk of them centered around the conduct of the Attorney General. It appears it's an issue of serious concern to your side and Mr. Chikata made that point strongly. Yes, so you, you notice that Mr. Chikata's supplementary affidavit was supposed to give to the court a plethora of conduct that the Attorney General has displayed which conduct does not sit well with our legal profession. And you notice that he quoted the Legal Profession Act, which does not allow for comments such as what the Attorney General engaged in. And so the Attorney General's conduct was an issue before the court. And uh, I'm happy the senior Charles Jukata took him to the cleaners, and you all saw it. Is that the end of it for you, or you intend to take some steps with regards to the concerns no, that you have? And, and senior has indicated that his main concern is to bring the conduct of the Attorney General before the court. We don't intend to take any further action. But if this becomes too much, I think we will advise ourselves. I mean, I, because we don't have the chance to interact with Mr. Kwesin himself, I guess this simply means that he's getting back to the campaign grounds to continue so with his work. This way. evening, he's going back. The people of Asin North should prepare to receive him. They are going, there, 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 there's going to be a big welcome. From, 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 from the hands of the government, the government that is persecuting him. So his entry into Asin North this night will be a welcome, a big welcome to him. And we're keeping our eyes on the Asin North constituency uh, just to get the latest for you on your election headquarters. But a uh, good time now uh, to speak to legal affairs correspondent Joseph Agable, who's joining us uh, now after a very heated court session. Blay, uh, we understand that the conduct of the AG came up strongly once again. Uh, just run us through the highlights of this legal argument and what exactly the NDC council uh, is seeking to put across to the court. I mean, it's centered around some comments that the AG had made. It was actually in an interview that he had with me some many months back. Uh, it was after the Supreme Court had delivered a decision on the Kwesin matter, and he had made a point that Mr. Kwesin will suffer the same fate as Adam Musa Kande. So we, we did that story, it was published on myjoonline.com. Mr. Chikata reproduced that story and attached, attached them to his exhibits in court to make a case that he believes that those comments means that the AG is effectively prejudicing the court against James Jachi Kwesin in the sense that it is making it very difficult for Mr. Kwesin to have a fair trial. He says, as far as they are concerned, the Constitution guarantees the, the, the innocence of an accused person until the person is proven to be guilty. And so they believe that at that particular point that was being made was not the right one to be made by the attorney general. So they brought that to the attention of the court. The AG strongly objected to it and took the view that those documents that have been brought to the court should not be admitted entirely. He described them as being totally irrelevant. He said they were being advanced for absurd reasons. Mm. And that as far as he was concerned, those comments that he made were in a civil trial. Mm. And the reference in those publications, nowhere in the story of myjoonline.com does it make the point that it amounted to a criminal case. He was purely commenting on a civil matter. And so those are no matters that he believes has any influence on a criminal trial that is taking place currently. And I so see. he took the view that the court should not admit those particular things. But the court disagreed and admitted them into evidence, saying that it reserves the right to admit such matters if it considers it to be relevant. And as far as the claim has been made that he's making comments which amounts to a prejudice by way of the court proceedings, the court has the right to admit him, and the court admitted the document. And, and also we can see from the initial uh, video we play that there's a huge level of solidarity from rank and file of the National Democratic uh, Congress with notable persons uh, uh, presenting themselves in court today to, to show support to the embattled James Dachi Kwesi. We just saw there uh, the 2020 vice presidential candidate of the National Democratic Congress, uh, the prof who's uh, been with James Dachi Kwesi ever since this started. Uh, we saw the likes of Chachi Chikata, of course, who's defending uh, the individual in court. Who, who else is showing up in court today? I mean, Kojo Bonsu was also present a short while ago. We know he contested 
for the NDC's presidential primaries. Uh, not successful, but he was also present to throw his weight. There were a number of members of parliament, former attorney generals, Mareta Buyapi Opong, Betty Modi, Bisu, legal practitioners, Ebiji Tamaklo, Tony Lita, a host of individuals in the legal fraternity and outside it in terms of affiliation with the NDC being present. I spoke to Kojo Bosu, and he makes the point that he believes what is happening to Mr. Kwesi is simply unfair. For solidarity, yes. I mean, what, what do you make of all that has been going on in terms of in relation to him? Um, I think um, this is totally unfair. And we're going through the rules of the law. Um, we can't be coming here daily as the man is campaigning. Anyway, let's see what happens on Friday. And I think the judge did very well. Said we should just rest and come in on Friday. And I think um, we are watching. It's, you see, it's precedent that they are trying to set. And it's going to be a problem in this country. But I believe that justice must prevail. Justice, he says, must prevail. Uh, that's uh, an argument that, of course, uh, has come up as well. Uh, the concerns about whether or not the court itself is being fair to James Jachi question. Uh, how did that play out in court today? I mean, in terms of the proceedings itself, I mean, as far as the court was concerned, the court uh, took the view that it was only fair to all sides that they are given ample time to raise their issues and advance them as cogently as they want to do mm. so. And the court now took the view that it's coming back Right. on Friday to deliver a ruling. Uh, but then, we know that you've been engaging James Dachi Kwesin. Uh, of course, hearing from him sounds refreshing. At a point in time, uh, of course, he had concerns about uh, government's decision to uh, prosecute this case in, in, in the first place. Now, uh, everything seems to be uh, unfolding in court. Is he keeping the same mood, the same posture? And what's his view on uh, this current trial going on? In fact, very brief comments, he barely wanted to engage, actually, but he made a point, possibly, that as far as he's concerned, he's focused on winning the seat and he's embarking on that aggressive campaign, and he thinks that, in terms of his victory, it's a done deal. Uh, we'll uh, definitely get to uh, find out a, a bit more of what uh, James Chikwesi has been uh, talking about to my colleague. Um, of course, uh, Joseph Agable, who's uh, getting us the very latest uh, from court. And uh, we understand that there's a lot also happening uh, in the constituency as we speak. Blay, just hold on for us briefly, uh, because there's a need to, for, for us to also hear from the governing uh, New Patriotic Party, uh, which says that it's setting the record straight on a number of uh, issues happening uh, there. We'll uh, be speaking shortly uh, to some of the leading figures within the area uh, who have been jeering up for that press uh, briefing. Uh, but we know that as the campaign towards the Asin North by election hits up, traditional authorities also in the area are uh, calling on two major political parties, uh, the NDC and the NPP, to speak with their supporters and spare the people of the Asin area of any violence, uh, confrontations, and also a possible case of bloodshed. Uh, Chief of the Asin Briku area, Nana Odro. Uh, as Sri uh, has been indicating to join you that the competitive nature of the elections has the tendency to breed violence and also acrimony, and the uh, as of course we've seen in some earlier by elections. And of course, he's been asking for greater opportunity for his people to decide. Political parties have been frequenting the policies of the various traditional leaders within the Asin North constituency, seeking their blessings and support. Transport Minister Kweku Furie Siyama led the MPP delegation, including actor Ejaku, to the palace of the chief of Asin Breku to seek the blessings of the chief. Nana Odru Asiri Basayadom tagged the two political parties to advise their supporters against violence. <laughs> Nana no money, my acquaintance, yanya politics. Timestre, a hoddy, Monfan Chamis, mean to me, and your politics be a. As you're all aware, chiefs are not supposed to be engaged in politics, and so forgive me that I am able to give you my support or otherwise. To Buncum, bit me at Tonifa. Nice as some drinks of a bar, Nijamoa party for you so. 
All I can do is to back you with my blessings and prayers. The elections can go either way, and if it will be peaceful, then it depends on you, the political parties. You need to speak with your supporters so there wouldn't be any violence. The name of this town has already been tainted, and we do not want it to be visited with any violence. We don't want to hear that because of the by-election, someone has been shot or slugged with a machete or any other violent tendencies. So I will plead with you to speak with your supporters. I have already spoken with my people to comport themselves. I know that all of you are trying very hard in your campaigns, and I know that the electorate will determine the fate of your candidates. Transport Minister Kweko Furye Siyama outlined reasons why it would be unproductive for the MPP candidate to be voted against and implored on the chiefs and residents to rally around Charles Opoku for umbrella development. We came to plead with you because when a seat is vacant, we plead. And as we came here, we have heard a lot of things the NDC have been saying, that we are twisting the arms of George Achukasin in order to grab the seat from him. In the central region, the NDC has 13 seats and we have 10. Why didn't we twist their arms to claim many of the seats from them? This is because the law does not allow us to do that. There are laws in this country, and the court have duly given their judgment that something untoward happened as far as Joe Kwesin is concerned. Because we have 18 months ahead of us, and the MPP is a party in power. And so if you are sending someone to represent you in this constituency, it is only proper and fair to choose the MPP candidate. If you send an NDC person, how will such a person go to the president and all follow me to lead him to the president? All we are saying is that for the next 18 months, it is the MPP that is in government. And if you are sending someone to seek development for you, then MPP is the obvious choice. When you vote for the MPP candidate, he can go to the president directly or go with a minister or join MPs to go to the president. The campaigns are heightening by the minute as the by-election day inches closer. National, regional and constituency executives, members of parliament, ministers of state and former ministers of state are active participants in the jostle for the seat. Reporting for Joy News, Richard Kujunya Akon, Asen North. Well, James Jachikwesin also has this to say. He's indicating that he's moving to the constituency now, knowing that there's an allowance for him and to at least tour the area before Friday. Is now satisfied with the outcome? Well, I mean, it's, it's already been expressed, so I'm not going to comment further. But you're ready to get onto the campaign grounds now? I'm, I'm leaving court and going right down to the grounds, yes. I mean, so far, in terms of how it's going, you're confident that you're going to win the seat once again? already won. He's going to win. He's going to win. And indeed, we are your election headquarters. Thanks for staying with us. We'll get to updates on our scene not shortly. But uh, while that race is heating up, the former general secretary of the uh, governing New Patriotic Party, Kobana Japan, uh, says that the New Patriotic Party cannot continue to mislead itself with excitable slogans that will lead the party to nowhere. According to him, Ghana is uh, rarely at crossroads. And uh, what the country needs urgently now is a new dawn of astute political leadership with a vision that inspires hope in the youth and rekindles the fate of Ghanaians in our constitutional democracy. He's therefore urging delegates of the party to be circumspect in their choice of leadership because the future lies in their hands. Kwabana Japan made this 
uh, pronouncement after filing his nominations to contest the flag bearership race of the NPP earlier today. Today I filed my nomination forms, which is a significant milestone on an inspired journey to lead our great party, the NPP, towards victory in 2024 elections. Mine is simply a humble redemption mission to create a critical mass of public-spirited Ghanaians, which is needed to generate the momentum required to cause a seismic shift in the thinking and orientation of what party politics and public service should mean to all us politicians, political appointees, civil servants, and indeed all Ghanaians. When I started on this journey, many people who heard my message of a new dawn very quickly came to wholly appreciate what is dear to my heart and came to understand why my vision and aspirations for the transformation of our dear country Ghana. In all humility, I am equipped to provide that sort of leadership that will restore the party as a genuinely united force that will make it possible for us to win the elusive third consecutive victory in 2024. I urge all party delegates to consider this. The future of our party and our country rests in your hands. In fact, it is in your bosom. They have a responsibility to choose the next leader of our party with wisdom and forethought. I want to paraphrase the great writer Octavia Butler. Quote, if you elect a poodle, you should be prepared to be led by unseen opportunists lurking in the shadows who control the poodle. If you elect an acquisitive person, then be prepared to have our precious resources plundered. On my part, I seek to restore our cherished values of service, sacrifice, and selflessness back into our body politic. It is these principles that have ensured the sustainability of this political tradition in the 63 years of political vagaries in this country. We need to instill authenticity, integrity, and substance back onto our political landscape. Leadership is about tackling difficult situations and providing solutions. We need to change our fortunes as a country. And I am confident that my strong will will propel me to win this battle with all my heart and all my soul. And with your help, delegates, I have no doubt that we will win. Let's make Ghana a land of opportunity for all. Trust me. This is just the beginning of many great things to come. Long live the MPP. God bless our homeland, Ghana. And we need to point out that the decision of Kwame Japong to join the race now pushes the uh, NPP's presidential primaries into a twofold elections. First, starting with a super delegates conference, uh, which is expected to take place, uh, to see the number down to five. Uh, let's get more from someone where my colleague who's been monitoring activities at the headquarters of the party. Uh, quite a rainy day, yet supporters of these individuals filing uh, their nominations still uh, have come out to support them. So what's happening on uh, the uh, new day, as we were pointing to learning of some new names joining the NPP race? Blessed, I must say it has been a very, very hectic um, day at the MPP headquarters. You know, it has been raining heavily here, uh, but the supporters are still strong to the party headquarters here to support the, um, their aspirants and uh, a mammoth crowd, of course. But at the moment, uh, all the uh, processes have ended for the day. We had three aspirants coming to file the nominations. They did it successfully. Uh, the first person was um, Kobina J. Japon, uh, whom you just played his uh, tape, followed by um, Kennedy J. Japon, who is a Sin Central MP, now aspiring to be the flag bearer of the NPP. And the third person is Kojo Poku. So, um, as you indicated earlier, the seal has been broken. What it means is that the NPP would have to go for, uh, I mean, Super National Delegates Conference to elect five to now go into the main elections and then they will now um, elect their uh, flag, bearer, uh, flag bearer ahead of the MPP, I mean the main elections in uh, 2024. So in all, we have eight aspirants successfully filing nomination. 
the outstanding. I'll just run you through those who have successfully filed their nomination in the order in which they filed. We had uh, the first person, the former trace and industry minister, um, I, I mean, um, Alan Kojo Chamanteng, coming to file the nomination, followed by the vice president, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Baumia. We had Dr. Fria Koto, who is a former uh, minister for food and agriculture. Uh, uh, Boache Jaku, the former energy minister, also followed suit. We had um, the, um, I mean, we know he's a prominent figure in the MPP. He is going for his third time. I'm talking about Professor Kofi Konedua Preko. Uh, you know, initially his uh, forms had some challenges, but they were actually rectified and he has successfully filed the nomination. And today we had Kobneje Japon come in, uh, Kennedy Japon, and then the last person for the day, uh, Kojo Poku, an energy consultant. So in all, eight have filed successfully. The three outstanding, we know there are 11 aspirants that actually picked the forms. The outstanding three are Mr. Uh, Eric Nketia, uh, he's a lecturer at the University of Education, Winneba. Uh, we have Adai Nemo, uh, MP, or a former MP for Mampon. The third person is the member of parliament for uh, Escado uh, constituency. Uh, in the uh, Western region, and then the former minister for, uh, uh, for railway development. They are the three outstanding. So um, they have uh, from today to the end of the week, because nominations or the filing of nominations will close at, uh, or on the 24th of uh, the, this month. So that is the um, update I can give you uh, here, Blessed. But I'm fortunate to be joined by the Director of Finance and Administration at the MPP headquarters here, Mr. Yamwa William, uh, to get more details as to what is now next for the party. Thank you very much for joining us on Joy News The Pause. Uh, we are grateful for your time. You're very welcome. Well, we know it has been a very hectic day. Did the party really expect the process to be somehow cumbersome? I'm talking about how people have thronged the premises and um, to support their aspirants? No, it's expected. Uh, this is a NPP. And then for NPP, you, you should expect that party grassroots have love for the party. So anytime there's a, uh, an activity ongoing, you should expect that people will come in their numbers to support their preferred candidates. So can you confirm to us, how many do you have on record successfully filing their nomination? Um, as of now, eight. Its um, members or aspirants have uh, duly filed their nominations. Are you expecting the remaining three to come and file their nominations? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Once they picked, I expect that they will bring it back. So we are looking forward to receiving their uh, nomination forms as well. We have just barely four days to end to close the nominations. Is there any anticipation that you may be extending the, the closing date for the nomination? No, not at all. We are not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will stick to the time. Yes. What, what, what do you make of the, how do you assess the aspirants who have come to file so far? Is it a case that they've met all the requirements, a reason you have made them to go through, or you have reserved some for the main vetting process? No, everybody has submitted the request, uh, requested or the required documentation, so we have everything on file. Yes. So we have three remaining. Yes, we have three remaining. Uh, that's Mr. Dynamo, yeah. um, Mr. Joe Gatti, and yes. Mr. Eric Nketiah. Can you confirm that for me? Eric Inkatia. Yeah, Eric that, that's Inkatia? the, uh, I understand he's a lecturer at the University of Education, Winneba. Is, is he the third candidate? No, Mr. Odenohu Opon. Odenohu Opon. Who, yes. who is he? He used to work at the Ghibli House, the director for transport. All right. So that means that the, the seal has been broken. You have to go for the super delegates conference. Is that what it means? Yes, we, we shall go for, for it. What does that mean? Can you explain for us? Okay, so by the constitution, if the number exceeds five, then there should be the need for special delegate congress, which we have slated August 26th for that. Are there talks, I mean, backdoor talks? Perhaps that, that, that is not my call. That's not my call. Because the party would need to organize in, no. in a quicker manner because you want to maintain or break the A, so you have to start the reorganization process far. Leadership anticipated all that, mm. and that was why we came out with the timelines. Mm. So it is not my call, neither any other person, to talk or engage any individuals to step down for another. That's not my call, and that is not the leadership cause as well. All right, so what message do you have for party members? The um, aspirants who have just gone through, are there guidelines you are giving them so far as campaigns are concerned? Yes, we do have um, rules and regulations, and then the general secretary has said it time and again that um, 
you will ensure a free, fair, peaceful, transparent process. And um, he means it. Um, so that is what we are looking forward to. And at the end of the process, everybody will indeed appreciate the outcome of, of it. And then, I mean, the delegates are going to choose or select, and then the leadership will only supervise it. And at the end of the process, we hand everything over to the Electoral Commission to uh, referee it. So it is not in our hands. And, and once the General Secretary and the leadership um, uh, have come out clearly and retreated time and again that the process is going to be smooth, free, peaceful, and transparent, we look forward to that. Thank you very much. You. So, Blessed, that's the Director of Finance and Administration here at the MPP headquarters, uh, Mr. Uh, Yamwa William, telling us the processes. So, it's obvious, uh, the next two months we should be having the Super Delegates Conference uh, uh, coming off. So, for now, this is what I can report from the headquarters of the NPP. You can take it over from me in the studio. Uh, grateful. That's my colleague Samuel Mbura joining us with the latest from the headquarters of the New Patriotic Party. Quite a lot on the table for the governing party. Uh, fortunate to have uh, Richard Akiangba, who's the communications director for the party, join us uh, for a conversation on all of these matters happening. Uh, whilst the party is focused on re internal reorganization, uh, you're equally dealing with the matters relating to the Asin uh, North constituency. I'd like to start of uh, from the confirmation we're getting now that indeed you will have that scenario of a two-fold elections in selecting your next presidential candidate. Uh, the number now moving to eight, we're expecting three more. It's going to be a tough uh, road for your political party in finding the next leader, you agree? Eight persons so far. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to you and your viewers. Um, well, it's a process we are committed to going through. So I wouldn't say difficult, but it's going to be a long process. Um, we, we know uh, that it would help us culminate in the right candidate for our party. And so we are committed to uh, going through the processes. That is a constitution we have uh, uh, enacted for ourselves and we're willing to adhere to its dictates. So I think that uh, uh, is good for us and uh, is good for democracy in our party. So. I will go through it, um, and then I think that it will make our party stronger, and um, I will get the right candidate to mm. represent us in the process. Uh, um, my, co my colleague Samuel Mbura raising mm -hmm. my, my colleague Samuel Mbura raising a conversation that, of course, your director of finance may not uh, have wanted to go into, but it's quite crucial: backroom negotiations and trying as much as possible uh, to simplify the process. Is the party considering talking to some of the candidates at least to back down so you can have a simple five-way? Uh, individuals contesting, and then you have a one-time uh, selection process. No, they, they, they. Hello, Richard. Uh, special um, electoral college election is process. Yeah, can you hear me? Act loud and clear. I'm saying sir. that the. Thank you, much. So I'm saying that the special electoral college uh, election is actually part of the simplification uh, of the process. So there isn't, or there shouldn't be. Uh, any need to want to cajole people uh, into withdrawing or anything of the sort. Uh, the process is not burdensome. It is not uh, a nuisance. It's a necessary democratic step that we want to take. And so there isn't any problem at all uh, with that process. It's just a question of uh, having a layer uh, before we get to the, the, the Congress itself to elect the inevitable candidate. Uh, we're just going through a process to screen it. Mm. Uh, Richard, it, it appears we're, we're losing you intermittently. Uh, but, but if you can hear me, um, I would want us to touch on the Asin North uh, by election uh, because that, that's what's on the front banner now. Uh, because as a political party, your party is, uh, of course, in the race as well. We heard from the traditional rulers today indicating that they would want this process to be peaceful, uh, no bloodshed, uh, no form of confrontation within the community. And the chiefs believe that if anything as such will happen, then it will be between the two main political parties, the National Democratic Congress and the New Patriotic Party. Uh, Richard, I hope you're with me. If you can hear me, this demand, this appeal for peace, is this a call you yield to as political parties, knowing the history of violence associated with by-elections in this country? 
Well, thank you very much. I think that um, uh, at the New Patriotic Party, we are committed to peace. Uh, you just had us organize um, a peaceful uh, by-election in Kumau. And coming into our say north, we made a similar commitment that uh, we're coming in and we're working hard. I have been here going on uh, past three, three weeks now. Um, just yesterday um, with a team, we have multiple teams that are canvassing across the constituency. We left um, eight o'clock in the morning. We returned home uh, yesterday around um, 11, well past 11 p.m. We're working. And that is evidence that we want peace. That is evidence that we want to win the election fair and square. So there's no need for violence. But what I said the last time, and I think I want to repeat the same thing, is that uh, it takes two to tango. And whilst we are engaged uh, in trying to canvass for votes, others must do the same. And the idea uh, is for us that if they are peaceful, then everything turns out to be peaceful. If we are, we are peaceful, they are peaceful, we have a peaceful election. On our part, we are earning the votes, and we who are working for votes will not create any mayhem to take away that vote from us. And so all I, I guess we can say is that the two political parties must commit themselves honestly uh, to peace. And on our part, I can confirm uh, to you without any sort of doubt that we are committed to ensuring that this election is peaceful. This election is the voice of the people, and that's what we are seeking to do. And we hope that the others uh, would do same. Well, it's been a busy day for the NDC's candidate, James Jachikwesin, who's embattled now. He's facing prosecution. And, uh, of course, after today, he has a, a, a relief of at least 24 hours to head back to the constituency. He says he's coming for the seat. And there's also the question as to winning fair and square. Don't you feel that this whole case, uh, if indeed, and I'm not saying that the NPP's candidates will win for sure, but if he does win, the issue about winning fair and square, does it not bother you as a political party? I'm, I'm not sure um, why I don't, I don't get your point. Uh, there isn't anything to worry about there. You remember uh, Adamu Sakande, right? When he was, uh, when he was in prison, uh, when he had his own case, there was a by-election, wasn't it? And somebody won it. Um, is there any concern there to say that somebody didn't win a fair and square? Um, I think that we worry sometimes more about uh, the peripheral issue. The substance of it is that we must have a democratic election, which is between the political parties putting up their candidates and the people deciding. That process is ongoing. Now, whatever challenge he's, he faces, that is a problem he has created. That's a situation that he's brought about, not us. So he needs to worry about that. But what we are worried about is the democratic process that must be peaceful, that allows all of us to come here and canvass. And we're canvassing for our candidate because we believe that our candidate represents a better choice for the good people of our city. Yeah, but, so but the, the likelihood, other... but, but the, I mean, you agree, the likelihood of going to jail has dominated the political rhetoric. We had for, from the likes of the former president, John Mahama, who's, of course, coming at you as a political party, the NPP, for using that as part of your campaign strategy and insisting that James Jachikwesin will not go to jail. You've seen that. Well, it's the, yeah, it's the former president who said that he will not go to jail. He said that. So I'm not sure why he's accusing anybody. The former president was here in Asinov, and he's saying that uh, Jachikwesin will not go to jail today, he will not go to jail tomorrow. How, where, where he get that from, I don't know. So. He, if he is saying that, you should ask him why he's saying that. But in a, in a position where somebody is, is anticipating or has a fair view of saying that, well, he's likely to go to jail, is based on fact. There is evidence of people perjuring themselves and then ending up going to jail. Is that not a natural thing or something that has happened before? There are precedents for that. If you commit a crime and or there is an allegation that you've committed a crime and you go to court, probabilities are that you'll be acquitted or you'll be jailed. So if people choose to say that possibly, looking at the probability he will go to jail, and you look at our history, there, there's a precedent for that crime that is alleged, uh, alleged that he is committed, then you can say there's a good probability that he'll go to jail. But we are not a judge. I am probably not a judge. You are not a judge. But the case will be determined in court. But if you are looking at uh, precedents, things that have happened before, you're looking at history, 
you are more, you are not wrong if you suggest that he's likely to go to jail because the law that is being accused of being in breach of that law, somebody else breached that law and ended up in jail. So if you say that, I don't think that you are coming from um, a wrong place. It's mm. just a probability that we are making. Now, the former president was categorical in saying that he will not go to jail. How about that? What is his assurance? And there have been a lot of uh, dust that the NDC is trying to you know, throw up in the air to create the appearance of somebody doing something untoward. Look, bless it. It is he who commits the crime or it is he who is alleged to have committed a crime. Mm -hmm. He needs to explain. We don't have anything to explain. If he had not created this situation, there will be no need to be talking about court case. In fact, there will be no need to be in Asin North right now, as you and I speak, to be conducting any by-election. And I have a firm belief, having heard things that I've heard here on the ground, that the, the, the NDC candidate intended to have his citizenship and assure himself that he will be in parliament before he renounced it. He did that in 2012. He came here and didn't renounce his citizenship. He, con he wanted to contest. They disqualified him. Why since 2012? Why haven't he renounced his citizenship? If you knew that that was a, a standard he must meet in order to be able to become a parliamentarian. 2016, he came again. After he tried in 2012, came back with a Canadian citizenship, tried to go to parliament. So th there is, there's a, there's a premeditated agenda by him to, by some well, well, divine... That, that's your claim. No, no, I, so, I mean, I'm just saying, this is yeah. on record. Mm -hmm. This, uh, bless it. This is, you see, sometimes let's not run away from the conversation. These are factual occurrences on record that he, is, he attempted to contest. The, the NDC people disqualified him in 2012. In 2016, he attempted. 2020, he came. All he wanted was that he wanted to actually assure himself. He wants to be in parliament before he renounces his state. And the, our law does not allow for that. So he is in breach, clearly. And in fact, if you are just even looking at motive, Right? If you are just examining his motive from 2012, you know, unless uh, Mr. Jechikwese wants to tell us that he doesn't know about Article 94.2a in our Constitution, that is how come he came in 2012 when he knew that there was that law, and then he came with a Canadian citizenship wanting to contest. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm. If, he, if he says that he doesn't know about 94 to a, then we'll probably uh, pardon him. But even at that point, what business does he have to go to Parliament if he doesn't know that that law but, is in the But in all, in, in all of this, is it worthwhile having the Attorney General pursue this case? Uh, There's the issue about the political will, when, of course, um, in Parliament, this is the same Minister of Justice who's seeking to push a bill that will reform our laws and allow dual citizens to hold parliamentary positions. So it's as though you're shooting yourselves in the foot as, as a no, government, as communicating speak, what your posture is on your nationality. Uh, uh, blessed, as we speak, what is the law? Oh, that's, that's what the law says, that it's not allowed. Yeah, so, so the law must be enforced. There is no guarantee that whatever bill is being pushed in Parliament will carry, right? If the, the bill doesn't carry, then what happens? In any case, are we assuming that, okay, because we are passing a bill, then you know we prospectively uh, begin to excuse people from its breach, right? We can't we can't have a conversation like that. So what the state of the law is must be enforced. If tomorrow the law changes, then we adhere to that standard. Otherwise, we are not going to have a, a constitution that is 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 uh, is worth its while. So we are interested in ensuring. Of course, that's what Jeti Kwesi the last time when he was in Parliament on the seventh of twenty first. Uh, 7th of 2021, uh, January, when he was sworn in, he swore, right, to that constitution. So all the provisions of that constitution must be adhered to to the letter. Now, somebody may be breaching the constitution. If it's not found out, that is, uh, that is one thing. But when you are found out to have been in breach of the law, then the law must deal with you. Otherwise, you create uh, a moral hazard uh, situation where people will mm. turn around and break okay. the law. And, 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 and want to be pardoned because mm. there is a bill in Parliament that possibly will overturn the kind of law they have breached. We are saying that let the law be applied to its fullest. Okay. And I think that Yeti Kwesin got himself in this situation. He had ample time in, in, the, in, the, in, in his lifetime to renounce that citizenship of uh, Canada. He failed to do it in 2012, 2016, he failed to do it. And he showed up again with the same tactics 
okay, wanted to get past, slide through. And now, unfortunately for him, the Lord has caught up with him. And I think that it is not anybody's fault that is in this situation. Oh, okay. In fact, the, bless it, yeah. he is not. The situation is not the victim. The good people of Asinov are the victim of the situation's conduct. Mm. Finally, uh, the, the accusation has come up. You've, of course, swept that away as a political party, and yet it keeps coming up. And this time around, with some v videos making rounds on social media, pointing to the fact that, not the fact, but the allegations that the new patriotic party is bribing or buying votes within the AC North area. The latest footage uh, depicting some individuals who look like constituents lining up or filing up for, uh, for receiving some of the goodies that have been offloaded from a pickup. Why does this come, uh, keep coming up about the new patriotic party if indeed it's not true? Because this time around we've seen videos also going around suggesting saying. Uh, blessed, I, I see the video that you have sent me, uh, uh, obviously, for me to look at. Is that a video you're talking Precisely, about? Precisely, yes. Well, well, that video, do you know the location of that video, where that video was taken? Well, that's why I'm putting that to you as a political party, because... Okay. So, so, so um, but then your description of that video is not accurate. It's not a video of people lined up to receive anything. That video you saw is at our campaign headquarters here in Asendo. Okay, so you agree that these are, these are your people? I'm saying that, well, I'm, I'm telling you, so we, we have uh, that video taken in a, in, a, in a center where we have our campaign. Mm -hmm. I think in that video you sent me, you saw uh, individuals in there that are possibly Some, yes. uh, our people. But what, I'm, what your description is, is what I don't agree with, to okay. say that people lining up to receive something. Now, I don't know any, anywhere, any rule that says that we cannot have uh, properties in our campaign headquarters, okay? So I think that you just need to get a context right. Those are things that so, are- So what, so what was happening then? Who, what was happening then from the position of what the political party? What did you party? see from the video? I have not seen the video yet, but I, I, I've heard conversations but, about it. You but, said it but, to me, but I'm but, not saying yeah. to you that. No, <laughs> I, I want to hear your to rendition you, yes. because, what, mm. uh, hold on. I want to hear your rendition because what it is is that it's a, a, a video that has no beginning and it's just in the middle and doesn't have any narrative to it. And people are putting narrative to it that is unfortunate, right? So what you saw is not a video of distributing anything to anybody, right? It's a video of, uh, a vehicle in our campaign center, mm -hmm. parking stuff in it, and the narrative you said, that's the reason I wanted to hear what okay. you what you think right. about it, but it's just in our, prop in our property, things that we need to use that are there, but it's not anything that you said to be that people are uh, lining up to, to be given or to receive things. That's not... Uh, well, well I, I honestly don't that have an opinion. I, I don't have, so have the, an opinion on, on the video. I don't have an opinion. I, I, I was did, just describing I was just why... describing some of the elements we saw in that video, and I'm putting that to you as a political party. No, but, no okay. So, yeah, fine. The, the things in there, they are one thing, but I'm, I, the point I wanted to correct right. in your mm. description is that uh, right. There's evidence of things that uh, people are getting ready to receive. No, these are this is in our property, and the things in our property. I don't think there is any law against anything being in our property, and there is no evidence in that that people are receiving anything. And so, what you saw is our property, and it is in our pre premises. It's not given to anybody. But by the way, by the way, uh, uh, blessed, there have been videos. Okay, out there with the NDC sharing, actually visibly sharing. I haven't seen you guys talk about that one. And you are now so busy talking about what is in our premises, Appreciate. not in anybody's house, but in our premises. I don't know any law that bars us from right. having stuff in our campaign headquarters. Okay. You understand? So All right. What so you see, what, what do you see in that video? It's not items that are being shared to people, and those people are our campaign workers. They are not 
uh, people who are in communities right. to be given anything. Mm. Uh, so please, let's okay. let's get a context. I, I right. get that. Um, you want us to equalize? Send over the videos. I'll send it to oh. Sami Jain for your good friend, and we'll see what the response will be. Well, I'm I can grateful. send it to you right now. But <laughs> yes, the point indeed. Is that I'll, I'll be happy I, to receive that. I, I'll send it to you right now, and <laughs> Thank I'll you. be interested uh, in, in, seeing, in when seeing what the response will be. Indeed, and, and uh, what the explanation <laughs> would be. Thank we'll, you very much. Well, thank you for joining us, uh, Richard Ahiangwa, Communications Director for the New Patriotic Party. And weeks after the independent power producers, IPPs, uh, threatened to shut down production to demand payments of their debt. The latest information from the IPPs is revealing that government is yet to commence any payments negotiations with them. Currently, government owes the IPPs over $1.4 million out of a $2 billion total energy sector debt. A couple of weeks ago, managing director for the ECG, Samuel Dubik Mahama, told John News that his outfit is leading talks with the independent power producers to avoid a possible shutdown of the power plants. We'll listen to the IPP's respond to him shortly, but first listen to Dubik Mahama making the point uh, on the Super Morning Show, insisting that the agreement will be reached. Had very, very productive discussions and they would not go off with all confidence. I would say ignore because you, we do owe them so I would say ignore, but what I'll say is that the conversations are far advanced to avert something like this. Mm -hmm. And so I can say with all confidence that it won't come to that. There are a few NDAs in place, but uh, let me give you a small hope. We are trying to find a way to make sure that the money expected of us to pay is reasonable and is within our reach. Because what IMF is saying that ring fence legacy debt, but you have to stay current. If the, 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 those excess and idle capacity charges are still existent, we cannot be current because we will still be punching above our, our, our weight limit. So we need to find a way with all of them at the table to agree on, a, on an amount or a tariff that holds this, uh, cap, these uh, excess payments for a longer period of time and then we can consider it in a different form for them. In fairness, everybody has a different way of how they set up the plant. Yeah. Some of them self-finance, so they don't really have lenders that are disturbing them. Others have lenders that are disturbing them. As I said, everybody's problem is different. Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of uh, IPP, Sally Kemapetokbo, says weeks after uh, that public announcement, government is yet to engage them. Uh, he maintains that they will um, watch, uh, actually switch off the plants if government fails to pay in the next uh, few days. Uh, we've not received any substantive payment uh, to sustain our operation or our pressing obligations that we need to fulfill to our stakeholders. Uh, so I can say we've not made any improvement in our uh, efforts to have our arrears paid. Initially, we were told that the ECG is supposed to lead some negotiations with you to do some monthly payment to defray the debt over time. Uh, has that negotiation started so far? No, we've not had any negotiation in that regard. None of the IPPs have been engaged in any conversation or discussion regarding that proposal. Besides, if they talk about monthly payment, you know our bills have to be settled within a specific uh, time frame that we call a credit period. Usually, uh, we can say 40 to 45 days. So we expect periodic payments as and when uh, revenues are collected to be disbursed. And we expect that by the end of those credit periods, the monthly bill or invoice will have been settled fully. But that is not the case. So I don't think it requires any new negotiation in that regard. Does that mean that you haven't heard anything officially from government since you put out that notice? Nothing officially from government, except for some interventions that uh, has been made by the World Bank with... Uh, the Ministry of Finance, uh, what we heard unofficially was that government says they do not have that money to pay. So uh, I can say that that is the only feedback we heard unofficially. What, what was the World Bank's proposal? Oh, I cannot tell exactly what the proposal was. But they were just sharing uh, concern about the situation and uh, with the assurance to engage government. But 
actually that is the feedback we got. With all of this playing, will our lights be on after 30th June? Oh, definitely. If there is no remedial action, uh, I cannot guarantee light from 30th June. Which will mean that uh, almost half of the power that feeds homes and uh, industry in Ghana would go off. Is there anything else government can do to avoid the lights going off? Uh, the ball is still in the court of government or ECG. We have made a demand. Actually, they show a good faith and said, oh, looking at the condition at stake, uh, can we offer you 20%? And uh, we, you know, we have always cooperated all this well. Not so they, they, they've not shown any good faith to us or demand. But our demand is purely based on what we need to uh, solve our challenges. There has not been any counter proposal from them. Well, let's now talk about a sustainable way of growing Africa's food systems. Agra has launched its strategic plan uh, here in Ghana, and if done that for Ghana, outlining its uh, vision uh, for the years 2023 to 2027. The strategy uh, has, uh, with a strong focus on achieve, uh, achieving food security, uh, which aims to address uh, the pressing challenges uh, faced uh, by uh, the agricultural sector. We're joined in studio now by Vice President, Strategic Partnership and uh, COP, that's uh, Vanessa Adams. Uh, she's joining us for more on this. Uh, it's uh, amazing to have you join us uh, here on The Pulse. It's Welcome. A pleasure. Thank you. Uh, for many who are not, um, of course, aware of what Agra does and how you run your operations, are you able to give us a brief background to uh, your activities, particularly here in Africa? It's a very hot topic. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having us here. We're so pleased to be in Ghana. Uh, I always feel I'm coming home to Ghana. So, as you know, food security in Africa is, uh, is a critical conversation. Uh, Africa is basically uh, currently being hit by climate variability, trade disputes, uh, price elevations, and um, as you know, the, the brunt of the burden always falls to the rural locally based smaller farmers uh, who end up being price takers rather than driving their own agenda. So Agra has always since inception uh, when Kofi Annan called for an African uh, solution so to food African. security, absolutely. And so uh, since 2006, uh, Agra has had a home in Kenya and in Ghana. We operate in 11 countries and we're expanding to 15 in this new strategic period. I see. And what makes this uh, a timely intervention for the country uh, has got to do with our huge import bills and, and the fact that in the next few years, Africa would have to feed a population that is above the world uh, population average, uh, I mean the average that we have now. Uh, what forms of strategies are you recommending in this new framework? I'm happy that you're talking about uh, the growing population. Uh, actually, uh, food, uh, people forget, is consumer driven, right? And so um, each country has their own profiles and preferences for foods. But what we're encouraging is actually, uh, first of all, a renewed focus on nutrition, uh, nutritious foods, which are nutritious and healthy for, for uh, importantly, for women and for youth but also that um, it's good for the soil. Soil fertility is such a huge issue across the continent. And of course, food doesn't grow in soil which is degraded and, and, um, and therefore there are issues of uh, soil acidity and productivity. One of the biggest threats which we all discuss is climate change. But in fact, if uh, farmers are able to have a more um, diversified growing systems using digital and data-driven evidence-based science technology solutions that enables them to optimize the land under cultivation. But for Ghana in particular, you know, the government has been pushing towards agroindustrialization. We want to see more processing locally, more value addition, not just being a food producing country, right? right. Uh, and so Agra has also been looking at the corridors mm -hmm. by which food is also traded. So it's a, there's a focus, of course, on growing markets within the region, 
being the host of the African continental free trade area is so critical for Ghana and for all of Africa as well. Uh, we'll talk about the potentials for, for that framework, uh, but also talking about climate change brings up the issue that's of concern to many eco-conscious citizens, the um, issues relating to illegal mining, galamse as we call it here, and how that is degrading arable land, uh, which of course investment should have been going there in, in growing more food and ensuring that we're food secure. How worried are you about this trend and what more forms of technology innovations can we uh, put in place to drive change? So humans are amazingly innovative and we're, um, uh, every day I wake up with renewed uh, uh, examples, hopes, ideas. In fact, uh, one of your other guests today is a young woman uh, entrepreneur who is winning an award. And one of our speakers earlier actually was a woman entrepreneur who was awarded in one of our youth uh, entrepreneurial competitions for her innovation using, uh, I think it's called turkey berries. There's a local name for this, into making into tea for iron fortified um, foods. And so that innovative spirit, that ability to adapt and, and to come up with solutions is something that we see and we want to encourage and facilitate. In fact, we've built a whole platform called Value for Her for women entrepreneurs who grow their networks and grow their capacities. And there are more than 4,000 women across Africa in 39 countries. And Ghana has always been a driver of women leadership and women entrepreneurship. So while I think we can be discouraged by some of the devastation which a few people can cause, uh, there are such reason for seeing hope and uh, our growing youth populations constantly driving innovation. Inspiring. Uh, but then let's talk about after. 1.3 uh, trillion markets, that's the potential. And we know that that could also feed into this whole strategy of ensuring that the continent is secure, food secure. Um, looking at the framework itself, it's um, off to a very slow paced start. But what, what do you envisage as part of the plan and how countries can feed into the continental free trade framework in order to build food security at the national level? So again, I'm going to um, alternate between dire situation and huge opportunity, right? right? Because uh, one of the, the, the um, highlights of our year is we host an annual food systems forum. Uh, it was here in Ghana in 2019. You might recall we talked about digital solutions for African agriculture. And um, this year we're focusing on resilience and recovery around food systems. And every September, more than 3,000 stakeholders, diehards, experts, scientists, and political leaders come together to really drive the agenda. And this year is the, the focus on AU supporting the African continental free trade area coming into force. On the one hand, it appears to be slow. On the other hand, we have the potential to leapfrog. You were around, I was around when cell phones started being operational in Africa. From one day to the next, the whole <laughs> transformation occurred. And penetration is so high at it's, this point. It, and in fact, uh, you know, communities use one cell yes. phone, just like old, uh, in the old days, you right. might have one radio that everybody would sit around and listen, right? So it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one correlation. People really share information and opportunities as soon as they get it. And so I really believe that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to touch the microphone. <laughs> it's fine. I believe that um, the leadership in Africa has really, with the externalities of the Russia-Ukraine crisis and the disruption and availability of certain raw materials, vegetable oils, wheat, um, the spiking prices of fertilizer, this has caused people to remember why we want to focus on investing ourselves in the continent reinvesting the profits which a few people see into opportunity, uh, opportunistic. And you're sounding almost like a prophetess because I was about uh -huh. dealing with the issue of uh, <laughs> the geopolitics, the, the Russian-Ukraine war and how it's impacting food security, um, the Black Sea Corridor issues, uh, issues about fertilizer reaching the continent and how, for instance, we have international agencies such as the UNDP reporting that the continent is facing a double crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic and then the onboarding of the um, Ukraine and Russian crisis. It's, it's all affecting issues surrounding food security here in Africa. How can Africa build resilience? 
So we've been extremely fortunate at AGRA to have uh, on our board previously uh, Strive Masiwa, as you know, the innovator and founder of Econet Wireless, and then he was followed by um, His Excellency Hali Mariam de Salen, both of whom really are leaders still in their various roles on the continent, many, many different um, leadership positions. But they push us at AGRA to continuously think forward to 2030. What's the Africa we want? We can be in the, the current uh, 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 looking at the, the downside and um, making a lot of headlines for global communities around crises. But when we look at the Africa we want, we see investors, we see opportunities, we see entrepreneurs and innovation. So I, I really see um, uh, 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 one of our uh, other board members, Ndidi Nunwele, has changed her business name to be the Africa change makers, right? Rather than talking uh, only about the, the, the deficits, let's talk about the story and drive the agenda. Because, you know, investment actually follows investment, right? So it's just like the, the uh, Wall Street investors. If right. somebody pulls out, everybody starts to panic, sell, sell, sell. But when someone goes in, they say, oh, why, why, why can't I buy that one? I want that stock. So we want to create that desirability, right? And, and Ghana has been on the forefront in times of driving the vision for uh, what's opportunity, what are the corridors in, in West Africa, and what's the trade investment agenda going to be for farmers to benefit. Because we don't want to leave behind people in rural communities. You don't want 30 million Ghanaians living in Accra or Kumasi, for sure. I wish we could go on and on, but unfortunately, we've been timed out. Thank you, Vanessa Adams, for joining us. And thanks for staying with us. While civil society organizations such as Imani Africa are demanding the withdrawal of the uh, planned asset lease deal between Tema Oil Refinery and uh, Torrentco Asset Management Company over lack of transparency, the Senior Staff Association of the Tema Oil Refinery have thrown their support behind its management and government over the deal. Reports have emerged uh, suggesting that the Public Procurement Authority is set to lease the state-owned oil refinery to Torrentco Asset Management for a period of six years. But speaking to Joy News over the concerns of the CSOs, Chairperson of the Senior Staff Association, Bright Adongo described the deal as the most credible alternative on the table. We think that the transaction should go ahead and it will help to solve the, the problems of the refinery. A deal that have gone through a basic process, that have gone through the board system, that have gone through with a general advisor, that all the stakeholders, senior finance, Ministry of Energy, has been involved and no objection has been issued, cannot be said to be not to be transparent. Obviously, that is not it. Currently, the refinery is going through a lot. You see, you have over $500 million debt overhang on the refinery. The refinery owns over 200 million Ghana CD to GRA. We owe ECG, they are cutting our life here and there. We owe Ghana water, and they are also cutting our water here and there. So I have said that look, the refinery is not making money, it's losing money. Okay, we, we, every transaction that we have entered, from who flows to Libra, we have done about 8 million barrels of crude oil. We made a loss of $10 million from BP. BP told him we did about $28 million loss. So the refinery is not making money. Okay, if the refinery is making money, then we shouldn't have been having all this debt overhang on our neck. Okay, so the purpose of this transaction that we are supporting the board and then the government on this matter is that it will enable them to have some managerial control to make the right decisions to bring to back to profitability and also make sure that they themselves will supply the seed because the government is not giving the crude, government is not giving the capital, and government is not also giving any sovereign guarantee to anybody that participates in the refinery. So you need to have some level of managerial control that will enable you to make the right decisions that will bring the refinery back to profitability. We are joined now by the chairperson of the Kinesaf Association, uh, Brian Tadongo. Thank you uh, for spending some time with us. This is a facility that's considered uh, to be of national importance, having, uh, of course, served the nation over the years, except for its state in which it is now. Uh, what makes the deal clean, as, as you're describing? 
Hello. I, I was just asking Hello. what what makes the deal clean as you're describing, sir. Okay. So, like I said earlier, um, this is a deal that I've gone through the process. It went through a competitive bidding, and then it was selected, and then the transactional advisors were appointed. Then it has to go through the the, the stakeholders, including SIGA Finance, and then the Ministry of Energy, and then the board as well. So. It is not a transaction that is like you just pick the company somewhere and then decided to say that oh, we, we are giving this uh, particular partnership to you. It's going through the process. And whatever needs to be looked at, whatever needs to be asked for. I mean, it's still running a transaction, and I think we're almost about 90% to 95%. So, I mean, that that is it. And... Uh, we have heard that people are talking about door oh, is being sold. It, 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 it's neither here nor there. In fact, there's a difference between sale and the lease that need to be clarified. The more you find is not for sale. It is a partnership that will allow a private partner to come in to be able to help to turn the fortunes of the refinery around. So that that mm -hmm. is that is what it is actually. Uh, the, the questions around uncertainties, especially for um, your workers there at Tema or Refinery, have you have you secured the assurance from the ministerial level that no job losses and that no future will be terminated as a result of this new takeover? So, for our engagement with the stakeholders from SIGA to the transaction advisors to the board and uh, whatever, as I speak to you right now. If you come to Tamari Refinery, in fact, I can tell you for a fact that we've lost most of our workers. In fact, we actually, we, if, if we have to do processing right now, we'll have to do a lot of employment in order to be able to keep up with the processing. Other than that, I don't know how we'll be able to do that. Okay. So the question is that mm -hmm. he, he, he's sacking you to work with who? When, in actual sense, he even needs to employ more in order to be able to do this work, okay? So that, that, that can never be true. The fact of the matter is that this is a transaction that will allow the partners to have some managerial control. And it is necessary because we have always said that tough problem is a management problem. And once you are coming to invest in the refinery, and then they are not going to be given any sovereign guarantee. The petroleum industry is a capital intensive one. If you are bringing uh, crude oil into Tamari Refinery and you have the three parcels of crude oil, one million barrel each, one million barrel each, one million barrel each, I can go. It's a lot of capital. So it gives you some level of managerial control in order to be able to make the right decision. That can give you that level of profitability. So that has nothing to do with staff losing their, 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 their jobs, okay? In fact, this will rather uh, improve staff's benefits, their livelihood. In fact, they have a program to do exchange programs in refineries outside the refinery, uh, outside the country, in order to boost the capacity of, of the refinery workers. So in, in other words, this is even rather better for the worker. Look, if you are having a scenario where for almost about seven years, poor worker salary have never been adjusted up. Let's look at the inflation that we are finding ourselves in. Today, poor workers' salary is nothing to talk about. Your salary is around $500. These Dan Guti and these uh, uh, Middle East refineries, they are giving you $5,000, $6,000. Okay? So for us, if this particular transaction is would rather be beneficial to workers in the sense that you will be able to not go and table to adjust your salary because mm -hmm. you will be processing and significant revenue will be coming in. And I see. You no, know, this this whole transaction is not just about so also just running, but then it must run and run profitably. Mm. Uh, but but you are saying that uh, you are saying that because you are advancing a union position. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. But the concern mm -hmm. of civil society is that the profit margin, for instance, and how much this private investor is reaping off, quote unquote. As, as, as their concerns are, it's not in the interest 
of the nation. Why are you not mindful of that? Okay, so, so let me say this. What we are saying is that the civil uh, service society organization, what is wrong on that? You are talking about Tor making $700 million profit. As to how they came to that, <laughs> I, I can't tell. How can a company making that level of profit and yet you have a debt overhang of $500 million on the debt? Okay, and, and you cannot pay your GRE $200 million. We owe everybody, including workers, workers' peer, $40 million. We, we can pay. Okay. And so if you are making that level of profit, why are you owing? So we are only advising the civil society organization. Look, so when you pick information, try and go to the source and cross check. Don't rush and go to market with an information which ends up to be not, not to be true. But the refinery is not making money. The refinery is making loss. All the transactions that we have done in the past. Look, like I keep on saying, from BP to what I have you, uh, who feels all we have been getting, you can come and check the books. We are there. We are losing $28 million. We are losing $10 million in the case of who feels. Look, the, the one that the government even gave us, we made over $30 million loss. So the refinery is actually losing money. And we are at a critical point where the refinery, in terms of the assets, if we don't take that, we lose the assets and the refinery will be gone. Because as we sit now, the critical plant, that is the RFCC, we have to, we have to as it were, uh, try and put nitrogen uh, in it and then more for it so that we will avoid losing the plant. We have boiler eight that uh, up to now we cannot even commission because we bring this boiler in order to be able to support right. the steam production. Uh -huh. We cannot. So if you look at our tank rich system now, over 59 uh, tanks, 20 is out of seven, we don't even have money for. And we are losing the assets. And the worst is that the workers are even also living. So for me, if, if you have this particular transaction on your team, and it is not like you are even comparing to anything on your hand, and you have opportunity that when you have found any other transaction that can give a better offer, buy them out of it. Okay, so I, 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 I see it. But, but, but it's not as though alternatives uh, have, not, have, have not been put forward about the future of this um, or refinery. Uh, th there was a regime or a previous leadership mm -hmm. of the um, this same NPP administration that proposed turning around the place and making it a tank farm. I'm sure that you as senior staff have heard of, the, of that proposal. Would that not rake in more money for the country as compared to this lease agreement that we're carrying? Okay, so let me put it this way. First, first and foremost, this refinery was built by the founder of this nation. What purpose? You see, the refinery was built at the time that we have not been planned to buy it. So the refinery should run strategically and for certain critical reasons. So for instance, if you're talking about tank farm, okay, the tank farm idea, if you realize the reason why both were set up, was supposed to be a strategic stock and you store over a period of time so that in case of any force majeure, you fall on that reserve. Okay, so the refinery is a refinery, it's not a storage tank. <laughs> so we should get it clear. And it should, it, 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 it should be made clear. I think the ring is gone out. Oh, no, I, I'm with you, sir. I'm, I'm listening yeah. to the point you're making, yes. Uh, so, so, so I think that. It is critical to understand adding value to our raw material and the, 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 the importance of the refinery running. Okay, so that is why we are saying that. Uh, if you look at your tank farm, you see, uh, this tank farm proposal, uh, the finance team had done some work where mm -hmm. other people wanted to look at storing products in our tanks. Yeah. They cracked the numbers. This has been the current proposal that is it. It doesn't come anywhere. So why don't you run the refinery and get the returns that we have on the table now? And then for strategic reasons, adding value to our raw material. It, it only makes sense. Yes, but, but I, I'm, I'm talking about the numbers. For instance, we're putting this national asset into a private person's hands as co compared to turning it around into a tank farm and still having the existing facilities um, such as BOSS, 
collaborating with your outfit so we can make some more money. So, 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 so as it stands now, this, this is a lease of a period that eventually after the lease period, it will return back to the government. Okay, so I think that needs to be emphasized. And if you want to collaborate with Boston to store its product in Pro, the Pro as it stands, we even allow private product, uh, private uh, companies to bring products in. Okay, I mean, we, 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 we build synergies at first. But the, the core mandate of Pro is refining. Okay, and the refining must be done and done well. And the numbers vis a vis the tank farm doesn't support the tank farm. Okay, look, we have, let's, let's even take the current tank farm system. We have, we have significant product accounting challenges. Okay, so if you have product accounting challenges and you don't have very good investment to be able to manage that you are paying tight in terms of the product accounting system, then obviously you will have problems. Okay, mm. so that is the crack of the matter. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, as we wrap up, are, are you equally mindful of what happens beyond the lease agreement? Yes, so you know the essence of all this private lease partnership is to be able to bring the refinery back into the path of profitability. In fact, the, the, the thinking of the leadership is that, look, before the lease ends and the refinery returns to profitability, our, our communication that we're trying to probably gather is for government to reduce its stake from majority status to minority status. And so that we can list through, for example, on the stock exchange and to allow Ghanaians only to buy the shares. You see, this will allow for to run and run very, very efficient. You have an example like Goy. Goy used to be a state's own enterprise. And today, Goy is on the stock market. And look at the profit that we are delivering on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, the balance sheet as of now. So what we are looking at is, is to bring refining back onto profitability. And hopefully we engage the, the, the owner of the refinery to reduce the state from majority status to minority status. Then it can go on the stock exchange. Then it can be managed prudently based upon profit. All right. Grateful. Uh, Brian Tadungu is chairperson of the Senior Staff Association uh, of the Tema Oil Refinery. Thank you. The country has recently uh, witnessed a distressing number of tragic incidents where individuals in romantic relationships have uh, resorted to taking their own lives. The alarming trend has sent shock waves throughout. Uh, the country and uh, ignited, of course, the agent calls for comprehensive measures to tackle the underlying issues contributing to these heartbreaking tragedies. In uh, recent months, several high-profile cases of uh, lovers' suicide have come to light, drawing widespread attention and concern. These incidents have cut across various age groups, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, and also Regions uh, underscoring the need for a deeper understanding of the complex factors contributing uh, to such acts of desperation. Uh, we'll go into details on that for you shortly. But first, let's uh, head to Kumasi, where the police uh, inspector uh, accused of gunning down his girlfriend in Kumasi says he's not guilty as he is committed for trial at the uh, court, um, of course, in July. Inspector Ahmed uh, Chumisi at the committal proceeding at the Sokari Mampon district uh, caught uh, angered uh, relatives of the deceased when he told the courts that he's not guilty, uh, but uh, prosecution told the courts that they are ready for his trial. They presented exhibits and original copies of reports on the case to the court ahead of the high court trial on July 13 this year. Uh, we're joined now by Erastus Saridonko, who's been following up uh, on the story for us, uh, joining us via Zoom. Erastus, uh, grateful for your time. What, what's the update and what more can you report about this uh, tragic story? Well, so um, this story has been running for close to uh, two months now. The inspector is with the weapons tactics unit of the Ghana Police Service in Kumasi. If you remember, uh, about a month ago, he shot his girlfriend six times uh, in the chest uh, at the Dume Poplar area in Kumasi. And 
uh, it was after you know what had become allegations of uh, the, what he found to be the woman trying to leave him mm -hmm. and so he decided to end her life because he according to him he has invested so much uh, in the lady and in fact um, from audio that we've had going around prior uh, to the act um, he was telling a lady friend that indeed he was going to kill the uh, a girl who is about who is in his late twenties, and he went ahead, he used his own uh, pistol. Uh, it's, it's an M22 uh, pistol, and shot her uh, six times. And in fact, when he came to court, uh, that's during his committal proceedings. He was being committed uh, to stand trial at a high court, and that is coming up in July 13. That is when during the trial. The judge asked that now that he's been committed for trial, does he have anything to say? And indeed, he said that he's not guilty. And that sound, to me, it came from somebody who is already broken. You see how his head was bowed, um, looking extremely sober. And that he is not guilty came out in a moment the tone, mm. somebody who is trying very hard not to cry. That, that's how it sounded. And it was almost coming out of uh, sobering, mm. that he was sobering beneath that point. Right. And then he said, yeah. So um, that angered the relatives a lot who had gathered outside that, you know, people saw you. CCTV cameras uh, came up with information, so they were not expecting that answer uh, from him. Okay, uh, but, but going forward, July 13, what are we expecting? If I were expecting a lot, um, uh, the judge consequently asked him whether he will be calling witnesses. He said yes, and that will be done by his lawyers. When finally his lawyer mounts the uh, you know, stand, he will call lawyers. He was also asked whether uh, he has any alibi. Uh, if Perhaps he will say that he did not commit the crime, and so he will later say where he was. The judge wanted him to say it now, so they put uh, it in the uh, docket. But he said, well, um, he has an alibi, but that will be communicated at a later date. And so we are expecting that the prosecution, as they've said, they've handed over the exhibit in court, the murder weapon, uh, they've handed over reports, other reports, uh, crime scene reports, autopsy report which indicates that the lady, the victim, uh, died of um, a hemorrhagic shock mm. out of gunshot wounds. And so they will be presenting all those facts before right. uh, the court to prove that indeed uh, he mm. was the one who killed her. Okay then. And our sister Cesare Donko giving us the latest on this case, but it's bringing up and opening up the conversation to uh, this love life and why we're seeing increasing cases of uh, lovers um, uh, attacking or either uh, killing um, uh, the other half. Uh, I want to bring in our psychologist, Dr. Isaac Newman, Atta, uh, for more on this. And, and Doc, you have uh, some sense of what goes through the minds of some of these victims uh, when these cases come up. But, but give us a mental picture of what, what one may be experiencing in such a situation. Uh, Dr. Newman, if you're with us, I was just asking about that and um, pictorial, you know, uh, that graphic image that you can draw for all of us to relate to what individuals go through in, in such circumstances. Uh, it appears that we're uh, having some challenges connecting with Dr. Isaac uh, Newman, who is joining us via Zoom. Uh, you're still watching The Pulse here on the Joy News channel. Uh, let's uh, try one more time to see if we can get Dr. Newman. Doc Dr. Newman, apologies for the, that. I was just asking you earlier about you painting the picture to us, what individuals such as this go through when, when they have these cases going on or their lovers disappoint them. Yeah, well, um, uh, I want to say thank you to you and also uh, I want to greet uh, all those who are watching. Uh, mental health issues are very, very uh, you know, important, very significant issues. And it has to do with how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. So anybody who's gone through any loss or any traumatic event or any event that is unpleasant, you know, 
there is this emotional pain that depending on what they've been going through, uh, they may not be able to even find words for. And depending on how they've been able to cope and adjust over many years, you know, current things may be too painful for them uh, to even handle. You know, so uh, for some people, when they have that emotional pain, some of them go into all kinds of behaviors. I don't want to mention on TV mm -hmm. because it's TV. Yeah, but, right. but in this case, for instance, I'm just wondering what may push someone to the extreme. We're not saying he is, um, of course, guilty of what's going on in court now, but what could pu push a lover to the extreme to say, uh, in some, ex uh, I mean, extreme cases, killing or going to the extent of, uh, of attacking physically the other half? Yeah, so I was talking about general emotional pain and sometimes some people even use self-injurious behaviors to cope with pain. So when it comes to pain, people have different you know, threshold to pain depending on how they, uh, you know, things have gone with them, even from childhood. So when it comes to people who demonstrate some uh, violent or criminal behaviors in this, in this manner, you know, there are various things. The first one has to do is there are some people who uh, have even a genetic risk to be to be more violent than others. Oh, really? You know, and so there are people, yes, there are people like that. You know, then also there are some others to who may be due to parental problems, you no know, right from childhood. Any child who's gone through any kind of uh, difficult childhood, including abuse and things like that, it doesn't matter the kind of abuse it is. You know, so parenting problems, you know, can turn kids into something else. So in the adult years, it just shows up. Mm. You know, some children, even as children, become very, very violent and aggressive. And usually it's as a result of, you know, unresolved internal problems and conflict and emotional problems, you know, and it turns into something else. Then again, too, everybody has a way of coping with life situations. Not everybody has the capacity, you know, to cope with disappointment the way they should. You know, and they may use all kinds of dysfunctional behaviors to cope with life situations. Some will use, you know, uh, uh, substances like marijuana, cocaine, and those uh, hard drugs. Some will use, you know, addict, some addictive behaviors like pornography, masturbation. Others may use uh, gambling. You know, others right. may also go mm -hmm. into some crime-related behaviors right. because they are not able to cope and adjust to life see. situations. You know. Interesting. Then again, yes, when there is any kind of uh, you know, loss. Uh, people may not be able to, like I said, be able to cope and adjust. Then they mm. use all kinds of things okay. to be able to, you know, express what whatever they feel in there. Uh, we need to have this conversation again. We're running out of time, Dr. Newman. And my instinct is just uh, leading me to ask you whether you've dealt with a heartbreak before. <laughs> oh, uh, obvious. obvious. Well, I was going there. I was younger. <laughs> I, I hope you, you weren't violent then. Uh, it's, been, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Newman. We'll have this conversation again. Uh, but thanks uh, for watching. That's all we have for you in this package of the polls. I'm blessed to can log on to myjoyonline.com. Um, we'll talk about the heartbreak later on, but that's all we have for you. Just log on. Bye-bye for now. Let's, it's Let's Talk Showbiz. But that will be after this break.